welcome to my channel. My name is Ketavon, and today we're going to be doing a book tag. So Anne Novella kindly tagged me in the Fake It book tag, which was originally created by Heather Gregg. So I'll link both those videos down below so you can check them out. But this one's really fun, and um, I think of some interesting uh, spins on the prompts. So, <laughs> so the Fake It tag is basically ten prompts in which um, there are like different themes related to like being fake or faking it or or um, just having to sort of pretend some some form of that and they're all very interesting so number one I'll start with is imposter syndrome an average person gains power so for that one I selected blindness by Jose Saramago and this one is translated um, from the Portuguese by Giovanni Pontiero and so this is the story of a dystopic um, post mid pandemic uh, society it's sort of like an unnamed city and a uh, someone becomes blind and everyone he comes into contact with also comes becomes blind and as you know these contacts spread more and more people are becoming blind and the city really doesn't know what to do with it so they just kind of throw everyone in an abandoned psychiatric hospital and say good luck <laughs> um you know you will shoot you if you try to escape <laughs> and that's sort of like how they deal with it and because it's it's uh, it's like barely any contact will transmit whatever is causing the blindness. Essentially what happens is there's a sort of small group of characters in the book that we are following and two of those characters are the doctor and his wife. So the doctor is a man of power. He's the person who I think examined the first patient zero and, and he that's why he was infected. And then he and his wife are in the asylum um, trying to create some semblance of order and, you know, not descend into complete chaos right away. And later on, it's revealed that actually the wife can still see. She never became blind. She's been pretending to be blind because as factions emerge in the hospital, um, power struggles, of course, are happening. And while, you know, she's just the doctor's wife and just a woman, um, she does have quite a bit of power and, and, you know, she can't, you know, explain that to people because then she would kind of lose that power a little bit. But her being able to secretly see what's actually going on becomes a very important um, aspect of the story. And it's very, very interesting to sort of see how she like manipulates this power and uses it to not only her advantage, but others' advantage too. So very interesting book, loved it. And um, she does get a lot of power all of a sudden out of nowhere. <laughs> So for prompt number two, um, becoming a change in career sparks a story. So for that, I selected the bell jar and I, you know, should have probably read this when I was like in college. <laughs> it would have been way more poignant, uh, but I'm glad I still read it. And if you haven't read it yet, highly recommend it. Um, this is Sylvia Plath's auto fiction. It's the only novel she ever wrote. And it's sort of um, a fictionalized version of her own life uh, during a time when she was in college. And she actually did an internship in New York City um, for a fashion magazine, I believe. And it sort of s began this whole series of events that led to an extremely uh, dangerous mental health episode uh, that sort of continues for, I think, at least a year or two. And uh, it was all sort of precipitated by this big, fancy New York City internship that she was so excited about. It was supposed to jumpstart her career. And it kind of also changed everything else about her life. Of course, she had mental health issues prior to this internship, but we'll just say like a lot of things happened at the internship that like might have triggered more mental health, more of a mental health episode than if she had just stayed home, so, so to speak. Don't want to spoil anything, but highly recommend this one. It's so good. So for number three, rebranding, a person or institution changes dramatically. So for this one, I don't have a hard copy because I listened to it on audiobook for a book club, I believe. And it's Remains of the Day by Kazuo Ishiguro. And this is like very well-known book. Um, it's classic, I think, by now. Um, and it's basically the story of a butler from an old English manor who uh, decides to take a road trip um, because his new boss, a big fancy American uh, millionaire, I believe, in uh, the 50s, yeah, in the 50s, uh, tells him, oh, go take a vacation, like, it's fine. And then on his vacation, he's reflecting um, about his life and his career uh, in service to British, um, not royals, but elite and and the landed gentry so to speak <laughs> um 
and he kind of realizes, you know, that he spent his whole life clinging to this like idea of, of royal blood being better than than commoner blood and so he's realizing also that he gave up a lot of his own life and happiness in service of these people and he's wondering maybe was it not worth it he realizes that at the very end or starts questioning that at the very very end for most of the book he's very much rigid like yes this is important this is how it should be uh so on and so forth and it's uh i didn't enjoy it for that reason um as much because i was like yes we get it you you're a royalist you're loyal <laughs> but at this point in history of course like the vampire was you know definitely crumbling in terms of um the old way of doing things and that was pretty clear from the changes happening um in his life as well he just didn't want to admit it i do want to consider rereading this because after i finished it i uh, read that he's actually meant to be read as a bit autistic uh, and that's why he was so successful as like the head butler of this big household because he you know was very exact and wanted everything a, a certain way and that way was the proper way so i'm I, i'm interested to reread that and if you read it after seeing this i want to hear um your thoughts on that sort of like take on on him as a character so um number four uh cover a book bought because of its cover so I don't think I've ever bought a book solely because of its cover. Like, I'm sorry, unless there's like zero internet service, I always check Goodreads and I check, you know, reviews and I read the back and I, I'm never going to just buy something just because it's pretty, uh, unless I already know the content is really good as well. Um, but I have <laughs> done something similar in terms of not the cover, but rather the publisher. So the vintage, oh, that's upside down. So the vintage red spines i adore these so much um because they just they flip open so perfectly um without any sort of effort put into it like this this has never been cracked and it just it'll just stay open like quite easily without any effort and so anytime I see a vintage red spine, I basically always pick it up if it's less than like five euro, uh, as long as I'm vaguely interested in the premise. So my, my standards for, for how interested I am go way down when it becomes a vintage uh, red spine. So three I've recently picked up for very, very inexpensively um, that I have had never heard of them before and, and had no idea they existed, but because it was a vintage red spine, it caught my eye. Um, the first one is A Town Like Alice by, um, see, I don't even know the author's name, uh, Neville Shoot. Shoot, I think is his name. Our protagonist is somewhere in Asia and then, um, during World War II and then is sent back to Australia, um, as a prisoner. Wait, I should read this. Oh, they're never actually in Australia. Okay, I totally misread that one. So maybe, I actually don't know what nationality the Jean Paget, so maybe she's French actually. <laughs> See, this is how little like I need to know about the story before I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll buy it. But anyway, so a woman is captured by Japanese forces um, somewhere in Asia during World War II and is on like a woman and child like prisoner detail. And um, they're being marched somewhere. And then on the march, she meets a man who um, steals food and is punished as a result and her uh, bond with him, I guess, makes up the majority of the story. So again, like the story is vaguely interesting, but man, that edition, like I, I will enjoy literally physically holding this book and I'm sure Vintage is a good selector of stories. So I'm, I picked that one up, no problem. So another one I picked up just because it was a red spine was Fateless by um, Emer... Kertes, I think is how you say his name. He's a Hungarian uh, Nobel Prize winner, actually. It's autofiction of um, a young uh, Hungarian Jew who is sent to um, Auschwitz, um, but he's actually like ostracized from the other Jews because he doesn't speak uh, Hebrew, and he, you know, he's he's sort of like according to the Nazis is Jewish, but like according to Jewish people, he's not Jewish and he doesn't necessarily feel super Jewish. Um, so he's sort of like ostracized even within the camp and it's sort of his story. Uh, and it's an auto fiction of the author. So um, I just, I saw Red Spine, 
Nobel Prize winner, boom, done. Decision made. <laughs> and the third one I picked out was I Captured the Castle by Doe Smith. Uh, again, had never heard of this before. So it's essentially the story of a, a British teenager who's living with her impoverished family in a crumbling castle. Uh, and then, you know, their lives, her, her and her family's lives are turned upside down when American heirs to the castle arrives and she falls in love for the first time. So it's sort of like a, I, I read, it's a teenage sort of story, but very classic and excellent. So no problem picking that one up because it is just going to be such a pleasure to read. <laughs> so the next prompt is number five, stories and music, book with uh, music as main theme or background. So this book actually doesn't have any music in it, really. Uh, I think the characters might discuss music a little bit, but they don't really, it's not a big theme. But uh, Lisa Crossmith does this really cool thing where she provides a playlist for you to read while you're reading her book, um, which I've never seen done before. Maybe it's been done before, but I, I think that's relatively new and different. And um, this copy doesn't have a playlist in the actual text, but on the publisher's site, there's like a playlist that you can just actually like press play and, and just listen to all of the the songs. And, and there's some pretty popular songs like it's like Phoebe Bridgers and Taylor Swift and Nina Simone and like you know lots of different kinds of music and so this book in particular is this close to okay and this is the story of um, um, a therapist who one day is just driving in the rain and she sees someone about to jump off a bridge and so she you know talks him down and she invites him to stay with him uh, with her for the weekend and uh, they just basically spend a weekend together and it's a very very heartwarming story it's um beautifully written and I think the music goes really really well with it so it's a nice background to have that. Number six, Spectacles, books set in the entertainment industry. Um, I'm going to select uh, Scrappy Little Nobody by Anna Kendrick. So if you don't know Anna Kendrick, I think she's most famous for being in Pitch Perfect, I want to say. Yeah, I was on a bit of a celebrity bio kick last year <laughs> and um, I read a bunch of celebrity bios and hers I actually really enjoyed. Like it was such a pleasure to read, it's super funny. And she basically just sort of explains her whole career trajectory and, and how she ended up where she is, which of course is like a stroke of luck. Um, I think she originally became famous because she's a tiny part in Twilight. Um, but she was like a very hardworking child actress for many, many years. And I think it's a good suggestion for this month because I think everyone is reading, um, uh, I'm glad, is it I'm Glad My Mom Died by Jeanette McCurdy, um, which is a very important story. I'm going to get to it. It's, I'm sure it'll be great. Um, but it is important to remember that like child actresses and actors can have a good time doing it and it can be healthy and it can be you know, a good thing for many children. Um, so I think that'll be an important read uh, to go alongside with, you know, McCurdy's book, which is also very important, of course. But um, yeah, she she lived in Maine. Her parents would drive her to New York City to audition for Broadway shows. And if you're not from the Northeast, that's far. It's like a five and a half hour drive, so one way. So that means like her parents were spending like a whole day, if not two days, like bringing her to auditions. And then once, of course, she had a job, that was a whole other story. So anyway, it was just a very like nice, refreshing read to see like parents being supportive and healthy and happy for their kid's career. <laughs> so I thought that'd be like, a good recommendation for, for this month. Um, okay, number seven, laughter lines, media in which comedy humor features. So I picked Invisible Cities by Italo Cavino so funny like literally laughing out loud this one uh, again by vintage red spines <laughs> you can see I'm, I'm loyal um this one is translated from the italian by william weaver and it is so so good i just like flew through it i was it was hilarious i was laughing out loud it's basically um it's not genghis kong it's kubla khan who i think is his son um, and marco Pol he has marco polo visiting him and he's like marco polo tell me about like this city or that city and Marco Polo like tells him all these like wild stories about all these different cities and and they're not real places like you like they're clearly fictional and it's like kind of ridiculous like satire but it's still so funny because you're just like wondering what city is he actually talking about or is he even talking about a city like you're, you're just so curious the insular little stories themselves are super funny as well and each one is like super short like that's one whole 
city. So yeah, I really love this one. Super, super funny. So number eight is fashion, a book or film set in the fashion world. And I also read this one on audio and it's called Dress Codes, How the Laws of Fashion Made History um, by Richard Thompson Ford. And so this one I actually, it was a failed buddy read with my sister. You never read it, <laughs> but it was really fun for me to read because my sister works in fashion and I'm interested in criminology. And so this was a book that uh, examined how like the not only social rules, but actual like laws and regulations and, and criminal codes around clothing sort of like helped to shape um, society and help to control people and, and put people in certain um, classes or, or groups. And it was a really, really interesting look at the history of clothing in general, um, mostly Western clothing, just to be clear, um, or actually all Western clothing. It was a really interesting look at it. I, I really enjoyed it. It was, I would say value neutral, um, because like, of course, in the more modern history, things like, you know, black people being punished for wearing um, dreadlocks or other like normal, like culturally appropriate styles of hair. He was kind of like neutral about that, which I found a bit surprising considering he's black, but you know, he was saying it's like wrong, but also like as a lawyer, he was like, these are the reasons why people do it. And like, wasn't exactly like angry about it. So if you're interested in sort of the history of, of Western culture around clothing, for the, the criminology of that, highly recommend that one. And then for number nine, drugs, uh, pharma, or addiction. So for this one, I selected Indian Horse by Richard Wag Wagamies. This one is a can by a Canadian um, First Nations author, and it follows the story of, what is his name, Saul. Um, growing up, he, he grew up originally, um, you know, out in nature, like, at, like in an Aboriginal community not Aboriginal, he's Canadian. Um, what is he? He's Ojibwe? Yeah. So, um, so this book tells, so this book tells the story of Saul, who's an Ojibwe, um, teenager who then is, um, in a residential school. He remembers that he originally was growing up with his grandmother and his mother and father, um, out in nature, like in an Aboriginal, I keep saying Aboriginal. He's not Aboriginal. What am I doing? <laughs> In Ojibwe. He's Ojibwe. In an Ojibwe community, um, living in a, a, a traditional Ojibwe lifestyle with, you know, some influence from white settlers, but mostly, you know, living traditionally. And then he was sent to a residential school where he was abused. And then later as an adult, um, he becomes, um, like, one of the, the, the things he sort of grabs, grabs onto and, and pro to process his trauma is um, ice hockey. So he becomes a ice hockey player. But then that isn't, like, enough. And he ends up you know being being an alcoholic and and turning to alcohol um to sort of numb the pain it's a good ending like I'll say that so yeah it's very much sad and depressing read like it's very heavy for like the majority of the book so this one is supposed to be his best book um that he's written so far I think and so I was really happy to have read that one it's excellent um it's really beautifully written and also while difficult subject matter, it is easy to read and is in the story flows really well and it, it moves quickly and it's, it's an enjoyable read because it's not, you know, constant trauma all the time. It's, it's you know, mostly his life and, and things he's doing rather than like overt descriptions of trauma. So yay for that one. And then last but not least, Ever Youthful, a story from the point of view of a young person. And so this one is a very weird pick, I think. Um for this question. But the first thing that came to mind, I don't know why, but it was the first one that came to mind, was um, the Prince Princess de Cleve um, by Madame Lafayette, which is actually the first French novel ever written, um, which is cool. And um, also a book club pick for me, so I didn't even hear about it before that. And it is quite dry it's it's you know it's like the first novel so like it's not don't expect any of the modern like techniques in there but it is very interesting because the whole story from my perspective at least it wouldn't have happened if her mother had lived so basically this is the story of um, a very young princess um she is i believe 14 at the start of it and then maybe max 15 or 16 by the end 
and she marries this prince because her mother tells her like this is important and she ends up falling in love with someone else and because her mother told her that like you know being a good christian woman is important like you should be honest with your husband she tells her husband that she's fallen in love with another man but she wants to remain faithful to him so she needs his help to remain faithful as you can imagine the husband does not love that even though She's like so naive and young thinking like, oh, he'll be grateful that I'm honest with him. And like, it's so, it's just so sweet and naive. And here she is like, hmm, how do I like salvage my marriage at 15? So it is very sad. It is like very archaic writing, but it is like such a classic look at like a young unguided woman making terrible mistakes because she has no one in her corner, no one to protect her, no one who like really has her well-being at heart. Um, because obviously the guy that loves her really just wants to be with her and the guy that she's married to just wants like a, you know, a perfect wife. And like all of her other family members are just like, can you not embarrass us? Like, that'd be great, you know? <laughs> and she's just like, I don't know what to do. Like I'm 15 and I have feelings and you know, and um, she never does anything wrong. That's the worst part is like, she never actually does anything wrong. She never cheats. She never does anything. And yet, I don't want to spoil it, but just such a shame. So yeah, all, all throughout, I was just like, oh, this poor child is dealing with so much. <laughs> that's the only thing I was thinking when I read this book. So that's what I'm recommending for Ever Youthful. And those are the prompts. So thank you so much for, for listening along to all my selections. I hope this was an interesting and um, varied uh, list of books here for, for this tag. Uh, thanks again for Ann Novella for tagging me and for Heather Gregg for making the tag. It was super fun to do. So thanks again. And until next time, bye.